In the early part of the 1980s, music had revolutionized in a way where an entire album or movie score could be composed on one machine that was capable of producing a diverse number of musical sounds and rhythms. This genre of music that was produced as a result was commonly referred to as synthesizer pop or synth pop, and its sound dominated the airwaves and silver screen of that time, making it synonymous with the era. Its popularity was relatively short-lived, though, with commercial success for musical artists peaking between 1981 and 1985. However, something happened in May of 1987. Hello and welcome, or welcome back, to the Awesome Blackness channel. I am the Mighty One, and on this platform, we celebrate the awesomeness of our black people. That's right, whether you're big or small, celebrity or civilian, anywhere in the world. If you're awesome, you're featured here. And today, we're highlighting none other than vocalist and musician Mick Murphy. Though still quite young, Murphy was essentially a seasoned performer and industry veteran by the time he met with his contemporary, David Frank, and they formed The System in the early 1980s. Which is why, through nothing short of synergy, they would create a song that would not only capture the number one spot on the Billboard R&B Singles chart and reach number four on the Billboard Hot 100, but serve as the definitive swan song of the 80s. Its success would propel the 29-year-old into a new strata that included a number one spot on the soundtrack of one of the highest grossing films of 1988, starring another Murphy of note. Born on the 9th of January in 1958, Michael Austin Murphy is from Raleigh, North Carolina, but moved to New York at an early age, landing in Jamaica, Queens. According to him, he began singing, like most artists, in the church. However, he was able to emulate the sounds of Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, and James Brown, to name a few. Around the age of 13 or 14, he would join his first group, and from there, with his momager in tow, Murphy would go to various social clubs along the eastern seaboard and perform, opening for the larger acts of that time. In an interview, he states that this is essentially how he cut his teeth as an artist. He would later head a funk band, Jack Sass, who played at an uptown Manhattan club called The Cellar, where he would alternate weeks with bands like Kinky Fox, which contained singer Johnny Kemp, best known for his humongous ode to Payday that I personally play every two weeks. Murphy with Sass would do gigs in the tri-state club circuit of New Jersey, Long Island, and Rhode Island, with occasional summer gigs in Cape Cod. Work began picking up that included studio sessions with notable artists of the time. It was also around this time he would meet an eccentric French West Indies businessman and producer, Jacques Fred Peters, head of Little Macho Records. Freddie, as he was called, was part of the post-disco movement and spent his time between the United States and Italy, building what would turn out to be a notable musical empire. Murphy stated that he first met Freddie around 1979 in a lobby of what is now the Hotel Safatel with French music artist Christian Carbaza. At the time, they were having an international hit with Peter Jacques Band and looking for musicians to front this studio project. They offered Murphy a tour, but the money was ridiculously low and he was doing a lot better on his own, so there was no deal. Concurrently, Murphy had also been making inroads at Atlantic Records, where he was invited to sing on a number of projects. Freddie maintained contact with Murphy as he seemed to be fully ingrained into the New York music scene and a business rapport would be established. Eventually, Freddie asked Murphy to help run his New York wing of Macho with two other partners. It was there where Murphy would learn the inside game. He stated that he had to deal with publishers and other industry workers and occasionally flew out to the West Coast on business from the label. 
Murphy also stated that Freddie would oftentimes go back to Italy for weeks and entrust a barely passed driving age Murphy with his BMW 733i. Around 1981, Murphy's time with Little Macho came to an end, with Freddie facing a litany of financial troubles. The writing was on the wall. While working in New York City, classical pianist David Frank was called in to do a session for a local studio owner who suggested that he use the time to create a dance song. Frank initially wanted to use his upstairs neighbor and bandmate, a pre-stardom Madonna. Instead, he called up Murphy, whom he knew while working as a tour keyboardist with the band Clear, a group where Murphy served as their road manager. Frank offered Murphy a job as an agent if he could get him gigs with the many artists Murphy had relationships with. However, when Murphy heard an unfinished track Frank was working on, what resulted was an all-night recording session that brought forth the song, It's Passion. The track was mixed and mastered for Murphy to listen to on his sound system at home. And when he heard it, he stated to himself that it was the song he had been searching for his entire career. Murphy knew an engineer friend who put the track on a 12-inch acetate record. The engineer suggested Murphy shop it to Jerry Greenberg's Mirage Records, distributed by Atlantic. The track was played to the execs, including Greenberg, who offered Murphy a deal right on the spot. Murphy excitedly called Frank, telling him that they had a record deal. The track was made in May of 1982. By June, its passion became a hit on dance music stations and in dance clubs played on both the East and West Coast. The duo's next single, You Are In My System, broke through to urban radio and hit number 10 R&B in early 1983. Their debut album, Sweat, yielded the dance club favorites, I Won't Let Go, Go For What You Know, and Sweat. Other system LPs on Mirage were Experiment in 1984, and their final Mirage album, The Pleasure Seekers, in 1985. With such an innovative sound, the system became in-demand songwriters, producers, and musicians. They can be heard on Phil Collins' S -S -S Studio, Shaka Khan's I Feel For You, its follow-up, This Is My Night, and m Toom's Juicy Fruit. The system contributed tracks to two Eddie Murphy movie blockbusters, Beverly Hills Cop, and coming to America. The latter, obviously the more popular for reasons noted later, was the featured song on the soundtrack and went to number 23 on the Billboard R&B chart in the summer of 1988. In February of 1987, Frank, as usual, was piddling around with a musical track, wondering whether he was wasting his time spending the better part of three days working on different ideas and options. Murphy heard the music, instantly liked it, and wrote the lyrics and melodies over the track. It still needed a link between the verse and chorus, and what was eventually worked out was a famous bridge. Hang the sign up on the door. Frank stated that it took a long time to get it right but it was worth it. The group's manager and record company didn't believe in the potential magic the duo had, but it eventually became their single, Don't Disturb This Groove, and the rest is history. The two would go on to produce tracks on albums for artists, including Ashford and Simpson, Philip Bailey of Earth, Wind, and Fire, Jeff Lorber, Angela Bofill, and Nona Hendrix, However, the system would go on a hiatus at the end of the 1980s, their final album of that era being Rhythm and Romance. Their single, Midnight Special, was in the top five of the Billboard R&B chart. Murphy briefly pursued a solo career in 1991. 
he released his debut album, Touch, which featured a minor R&B hit, Fit to be Tied. He was a featured vocalist on Home and Garden's 2007 album, Domesticated, which was released on Ohm Records and produced by Tim K and Timothy Shoemaker. Murphy would reunite with Frank to record two albums, ESP in 2000 and System Overload in 2013. They still appear to be on the best of terms, reminiscing about the group's origins in a recent interview. Murphy also continues to perform with his latest appearances, demonstrating that he hasn't lost a step. So what makes him awesome is apparent. African Americans have always demonstrated a propensity to move into realms of creative spaces that break cultural norms. Murphy is no different. He embraced and, per usual, sprinkled a little flavor into a genre of music that wasn't normally associated with melanated people. He was also an early advocate of integrating more technology into music, acknowledging the creative possibilities that it presented, and showing how he could incorporate soul even into a genre of music that is essentially machine manufactured. Okay, so thanks for watching. Murphy, who decided to follow me on Instagram, was an indelible part of my childhood. When I tell you I must have heard that song like a hundred times before confirming it was a brother, and then when I saw him, it was like my adolescent self had gotten permission to explore music on another level. I suppose it's the same feeling these melanated girls across the country are now experiencing now that they see that they too could be Little Mermaids. And while this may have been a mind blow for me at the time, I have another one down the pike that I was educated on just recently and it caused my brain to melt. So I'm going to put that together very soon and just stay tuned. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen here, you keep the love coming the best way you know how by liking and sharing. Get more people to like, share, subscribe, and click on that notification bell so you know when I drop another nugget. And until then, Stay awesome. Whoa. Okay.